Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check to make sure our video screen resolution is there so that you all will see a picture when you see this video. Because I hadn't checked it prior, but because the AI systems have the ability, as a matter of fact, I just looked at a website that told me that I could get their product. And it's, um, what do you call that thing? It's an extension that you can get for ChatGPT. That if you send an email to somebody, pay attention, if you send an email to somebody, that it has the ability of deleting that email from both your server and the server it was sent to. That's right. Even though you sent it to somebody, because it's on a server, it can go through and delete that email as if the person had never sent it to you so that you have no evidence. Remember in the 2012, 2011, we were losing all kinds of documents. Everybody, man, I know I had that document on my computer. And I would say to people, hold on, here it is. And I would send it to them again. Now, then it was missing from my computer after I sent it to them. So please understand that software and technology has been around for a while. Now, I just spoke with somebody who told me that was the case with a document that was sent to him by the court. Oh, wait, he didn't save a copy of the email. Ladies and gentlemen, there are email. Um, there is a software called uh, G Vault. G is in George Vault for Google. And you can get your Gmails and copy them and save them to your computer so that that type of stupid stuff doesn't happen to you. Now, it's not happening to everybody, but for people who do things like I do, that stuff is happening. Just like right now, we are back to individuals interfering with our emails so that we don't receive anything. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an automatic responder. If you don't receive the automatic responder, we haven't received nothing from you. If you receive the automatic responder saying, we received your, <laughs> then you ain't, you ain't got nothing coming because we don't know. <sighs> okay, what you see in the background, we're going to talk about this. Now, this is not a religious conversation. So those of you who think it's a religious conversation, go on. I ain't got time for you. I'm not going to explain all of that. I want to talk to some of you because, see, there are some people who are trying to figure out, especially with events like what's happening in Turkey, or even what's happening with you in your daily life. Where is this God character? If God exists, where is he? How come he hasn't been doing anything? Well, that's a that's a legitimate question. No, no, no. Honestly, it's a legitimate question, and I'm not going to talk to you about no religious answer. I'm going to tell you what's been said in Scripture for over 3,000 years. What's been said in Scripture for over 4,000 years. Now, Paul, this is a book of Hebrews. Paul, this is a book of Hebrews. Paul is going to be speaking, but he's going to be quoting from the what people refer to as the Old Testament. Okay, because it ain't getting any younger. All right. However, I want you to pay attention. Now, this is uh, going to be about 30 minutes, so be prepared. I'm only going to be reading from the scripture. I'm not going to be telling you what I think. Hold on now. The Bible doesn't need me to tell you what I think. The Bible will explain itself. I'm not going to, what, what do they call that? Translate the Bible? The Bible's already translated into English. I'm not going to interpret the Bible because it doesn't need any interpretation. What, what did Peter say? Interpretation was not born by any stupid man. But men were born alone from God, not born alone from their own thoughts. So I'm not going to interpret anything. So let's do here. We're going to go up to, well, we might as well go up to the top right here. For it is not, hold on, for it is not to angels that he has made, or he has subjected the inhabited earth to come to come not the inhabited earth now to come remember that's the subject of this we're talking about what's to come so hold on now it is not to angels that he has subjected the inhabited earth to come about which we are speaking but in one place a certain witness said what is man that you keep him in mind or the son of man that you take care of him ladies and gentlemen that's a valid question what is man that god would even be concerned with him he's like an ant hold on now you guys see ants and little other creatures crawling all the time. Do you not step on them, kill them? Get out of my house! I don't want these things in my house! Give me that spray! So the question is, what is man that God keeps him in mind? Man is nothing but a lowly piece of crap in more ways than one. 
Don't get offended by it because that's what we are. We are conniving, deceiving, vengeful, hateful. We destroy, we harm, we cause hurt. That's man. If you don't believe me, turn on the news. We steal from one another, pillage, assault one another, and take advantage of one another. That's us. We are man. So let me ask the question again. What is man that Jehovah keeps him in mind, or a son of man that he takes care of him? Now, you can find these, that original quote. Uh Uh-oh, it's not happening. It's supposed to hover. So let's go here. And let's see, O Jehovah, what is man that you should notice him? The son of mortal man that you should pay attention to him. This is David speaking, by the way. It is the 144th Psalm, stanza number three. These are not chapters in Psalms. Psalms is poems and songs. So these are stanzas and um, the number 144, stanza number three. There you go. That's how Psalms is written. But you can say chapter and verse in Psalms. Nobody's going to hurt you. They're not going to get mad. Well, some people will, the stupid people. Um, But it's okay. It's all right to be stupid, you know, because they both live in the same house, is and does. They they, they haven't moved. Okay. All right. Let's. Oh, it did. It did finally show up a second ago, but now it's gone. The thrill is gone. We're going to continue, if you guys don't mind. You made him. A little lower than angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor and appointed him over the works of your hands. All things you subjected under his feet. By subjecting all things to him, God left nothing that is not subjected to him. Jesus, by the way. Now, though, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. When Jesus came to the earth, um, his job was to reconcile men to God. Because remember, they were distant from him. They weren't doing the things he asked. So he was supposed to show them the way to how the things were supposed to be done. That was his job. And he did his job. He showed us what was required. So that was the reconciliation. Showing us what we needed to do to get right with the true God. Some people have paid attention. Others have not. And there's still time for that. Because remember, the earth that is to come, the inhabited earth that is to come, not a new earth, as in there's going to be a whole new planet. A whole new world. No, not that type of world, uh, Celine. But an inhabited earth that is to come. The earth will always remain inhabited. That is a promise from scripture. Another subject, we'll talk about that a different time. Pay attention. He says, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than angels, who now crowned with glory and honor for having suffered death, so that God's undeserved kindness, or excuse me, I I apologize, I'm reading ahead, so that by God's undeserved kindness, he might taste death for everyone. How did Jesus taste death? You, You taste food, don't you? Oh, man, that tastes good. Oh, that tastes horrible. Oh, man, that was, it was okay. It was kind of bland. Could have used a little bit more salt. How did Jesus taste death for everyone? Because he only experienced it for but a short time. He never had a chance to fully digest it because he did not remain subject to death. Pay attention. All things you subjected underneath his feet, and by subjecting all things to him, Nothing is not subjected to him. However, Jesus became subject to death for us. Why? Why, why, why did he become subject to death for us? Sorry, I need to move this over because I need to get to the bottom here so that I can do this. Why did he become subject to death on our behalf? You don't know? Because without his tasting death for mankind, without his tasting death for mankind, we would continue to die. We would continue to, but we're still dying. We are still dying. But remember, this is temporary. Well, it didn't say it was temporary. Really? 
Well, why do you think it says for it is not to angels that he made subjected that he subjected the inhabited earth to come? The inhabited earth to come? The inhabited earth to come? Yes. Then you go to Revelation and you go to the twenty first chapter and you see that there'll be no more death, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more outcry. That's the inhabited earth to come. So I'm going to continue, if you don't mind. For it is fitting that the one for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many sons of glory, should make the chief agent of their salvation perfect through suffering. Ladies and gentlemen, is it possible that the chief agent, Christ Jesus, being made perfect through suffering, that we experience the same perfection through our suffering? Through our endurance? I don't know. Let's see what it says. For both the one who is suffering and those who are being sanctified all stem from one. And for this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. As he says, I will declare your name to my brothers, and in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you with song. This is Psalms, I think it's either 139 or Pssalms 40. So let's go ahead and see, because it's said, it said in both Psalms 139 and Psalms 40. Let's see, I think this is one, nope, 22. I was wrong. I know it also says it in 139 and 40. I will declare your name to my brothers, and in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. So let's see, Psalms 40. And let's see if this one says Psalms uh, 139. Hold on. Let's put that there. I don't know. It ain't clicking. Let's click it. I have made your name manifest to the men you have given me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. This is the book of John. Okay. So, 17th chapter. Verse 6. Let's go back. That's why I said the Bible will interpret itself. Where is it coming from? It's right there. It tells you where it is. All right. And again... I will put my trust in him. And again, look, I and the young children whom Jehovah gave me, all speaking prophetically of Jesus. See, Jesus, by suffering death for all mankind, he now becomes the owner. Not the owner as in we're slaves and we have to do everything and we're just got to suffer. No, owner as in we owe our life to him. Owe our lives. Owner owing there you go. So glad you understand the association and correlation. Now let's continue. There's a reason for this, so don't think that we're there yet, okay? Because there are a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus, but do you understand who Jesus is and why he is? Because they want to say Jesus is God, but that was not the purpose of Jesus coming to the earth. You see, God didn't do this for himself. It was God who suffered not true, ladies and gentlemen. God doesn't suffer. <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> In the sense that you can cause him pain. He couldn't even make himself feel pain. People, you got to understand what limitations are there. We keep talking about God can do anything and everything. That's not true. He cannot die. He cannot lie. He cannot steal. He cannot cheat. There are so many things he cannot do. Okay? It's not possible. But everything is possible with God. No, not the impossible. The things that is impossible for him to do, the scriptures itself say it is impossible for God to lie. So you have to take it in context. You can't just take it literally, 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 because it's not designed that way. Shall we continue? Yes. Go right ahead, please. Therefore, since the young children are sharers in the blood and flesh, he also similarly shared in the same things. So that through his death, he might bring to nothing the one who has the means to cause death, that is the devil. Remember, the devil was the one who caused the death of Adam and Eve to begin with. If he had left Eve alone, man, this would be a perfect planet with perfect people, perfect everything, no problems. But he decided he wanted to cause their death. Now, how do we know he's the causer of death? According to what this says right here, the one having the means to cause death, how do we know that that is Satan? Well, it says that is Satan the devil, <laughs> okay? But how do we know that that's what it's implying? Because what did Satan do? He told Eve, is it not so that God has said that you must not eat from every tree of the garden? And she says, no, 
For he has said that we should eat from every tree of the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and bad. That we should not eat from it. No, we should not touch it lest we die. What he did was he questioned death, whether or not she would die. Is it not so? His whole issue was death. He was trying to cause her death. He was only speaking on the subject matter of death. Go back and read it again and see if you don't see it. I'm going to continue. And that he might set free all of those who were held in slavery and all their lives by their fear of death. We all fear death. None of us want to die. I don't want to die. Oh, no, I want to die. I wish I could die right now. Don't worry about it. You'll get your wish soon. Anyway, for it is not really angels that he is assisting. Jesus, by the way. But he is assisting Abraham's offspring. Now, wait, we are not all Abraham's offspring. A lot of people have gotten that so mixed up. The Abraham's offspring is defined in the Bible a certain way. Do your research. Okay, there is Abraham offspring in a figurative sense, that's one group, but then you have Abraham's offspring in a literal sense, that's another group. Then you have a third group, Abraham's offspring in a symbolic prophetic sense, that's another group. Do you research people? Consequently, uh oh, there's a consequence of this action of. Uh, assisting Abraham's offspring. So there's a consequence that comes with that. That's what consequently means. There's a consequence. Um, what is decisions consequence? Cause and effect. There is an effect that comes about for him assisting Abraham's offspring. Abraham's offspring since his death until now, because that's what it's talking about. He's assisting Abraham's offspring, exactly what he promised. Look, I will be with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. That was his promise. So let's continue to see what the consequences are of his assisting Abraham's offspring. He has become like his brothers in all respects so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things related to God. In order to offer a propitiatory sacrifice once and for all times for the sins of the people. Hold on now. Wait a minute. Now, for those of you who believe Jesus is God, it is impossible for Jesus to be God. Pay attention and be the high priest. Pay attention. Well, no, that's only part of him when he split and separated. No, sorry. Because according to the belief in a trinity, they're not split and separated now. They're all the same. It's only one God, just the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, if that is the case, how can God be his own high priest? Go ahead. No, no, just sit back and think about it. What does a high priest do? Look up the definition for high priest. Look and see what the high priest does and whom the high priest serves. Go ahead. We're going we're gonna to let you go ahead and do that while the rest of us continue. So, ladies and gentlemen. Because people choose to interpret scripture on their own instead of using scripture to interpret itself, we have all kind of beliefs out there. We Then we have a lot of people who refuse to believe because they can't believe what it says because that's impossible is what they say instead of seeing the reality of what's being said. So we're going to continue if you guys don't mind because we're getting to the point. It's going to be chapter four where the point is we're in chapter three right now, okay, but we're going to get there. <clears throat> Since he himself suffered, when being put to the test, he is able to come to the aid of those who are being put to the test, meaning your aid, my aid, and those offspring of Abraham, figuratively, prophetically, symbolically, and literally. We shall continue. Consequently, oh, look at that. There is another consequence of that action. Now, this is not a bad consequence. Neither of these two consequences are bad. They're just a consequence of the thing that has taken place. Holy brothers. Now, this is talking to the holy ones. You don't believe me? Go and take a look. Pay attention. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Yes, the Bible does teach that there are some who go to heaven. Not everybody, but there are some calling. Invitation. They were invited. That's why even Jesus says those who are invited to Many chosen, but few are chosen. I mean, many 
chosen, but few invited, okay? Just understand, that's what a calling is. Oh, I had a calling. It's not that type of calling, people. Lord have mercy, it's not that type of calling. Consider the apostle and high priest whom we acknowledge, Jesus. Those who have that calling acknowledge Jesus as their high priest. Look at that. So if you thought you had that calling and you didn't recognize Jesus as high priest, that's only one aspect of it, then you may have to revisit that uh, understanding that you had. Okay, that's the first thing. Let's continue. He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was also in all the house of that one. Hold on. It says Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him. Well, you can't be, if he was God, he couldn't be faithful to God. If he was God, that would make no sense. Because it says just as Moses also was in all the house of that one. God could not be like Moses. Go ahead. God could never be like Moses, but Jesus, God's son, since Moses was there to extend an understanding of what was to happen in the future, he was a forerunner, then yes, he could be likened to Moses, but not God. But we're, I digress. For he is counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Since the one who constructs the house has more honor than the house itself. Ladies and gentlemen, do you not understand that it's not the house that's beautiful, it's the architecture, how the house was designed. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying it, it's not Moses who was great, but it's the one who designed the plan in the first place. The, the, the architect of the whole plan, because there's a plan afoot. That's what we're getting to. So bear with me, because I know we, we said we were going to get there, but we are going to get there, but we're going to take this step by step, baby steps first, people. Because we got to understand, why is God allowing all of this to happen on this planet? <laughs> there is a lot of junk happening on this planet. People are dying every single day. But pay attention so that you guys understand. It was 12,000 people last night when I watched the news. We know it's going to be over 15,000 because those were whole buildings that fell and everybody was at home asleep. Ladies and gentlemen, these people were asleep when that earthquake happened. You just imagine being asleep and a building falling on top of you. Many of them did not wake up from that being asleep. Well, they woke up, but for a split second. But can you imagine the horror? There are people in certain cities in Turkey right now, ladies and gentlemen, that there's nobody to help them from underneath the rubble. They've been there for more than three days. It's been freezing at night. Where is Jehovah during all of this? That's what this is about. Would you mind if I go ahead and explain to you the scriptures so that you can see what's going on and what's been going on for the past 6,000 years? Well, that's what I'd like to do. Now, of course, every house is constructed by someone. That's right. There is an, there's an architect for every house. No house builds itself. Oh, well, the house of the Lord builds it. Oh, stop it. No house builds itself. Every house is constructed by someone. That is a fact. So it's giving you a fact. But the one who constructed all things is God. Now, Moses... He was faithful as an attendant in all the house of that one as a testimony, as a witness, because that's what the word testimony means. If you don't believe me, let's click on it. Witness. Let's go back. Of all things that were to be spoken afterwards, exactly what was expressed earlier, Moses was setting a pattern according to what was to come. So that's why Jesus could be called the greater Moses, which is exactly what it's saying. Okay, just as Moses, but Jesus was counted as with greater glory than Moses, since he who construct the house has more honor. So Jehovah, this is his plan. And so it was going to work out 
to what he wanted. Let's continue. Now, Moses was faithful as an attendant in all the house of that one, as a testimony of all things that were to be spoken afterwards. But Christ was faithful as a son over God's house. Did he not continue to tell those priests and those scribes and those Sadducees, stop making the house of my father a cave or a den of robbers? Did he not say, the zeal of your house will eat me up? Christ was faithful as a son over the house of God. We are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our freeness of speech of telling other people about this, and the hope of which we boast down to the end. The hope, now the hope Paul was speaking of is the ones who were partakers of the heavenly calling. But he's also speaking to those people who are not partakers of the heavenly calling, those people who are going to inhabit the earth that is to come. Two separate groups of people. Pay attention, one, heavenly calling, the other, the earth that is to come. Do you see how the scriptures make sense when we read it for what it says, as opposed to what grandma taught us? without showing us what it said. Grandma was a wonderful woman. She meant well, she loved us. But Grandma was given information that wasn't coming directly from the scriptures, or it came from a Bible that was outdated in its language, that the words didn't mean what we presume they meant. Let's continue. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, pay attention, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to pay attention to the present tense of that word, today. Today is not yesterday. Today is not tomorrow. Today is present tense. It's the tense of the word. Pay attention. That is the important part here. Just as the Holy Spirit says, let's click there. We're going to go there. We're going to go to Second Samuel. The Spirit of Jehovah spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. So when Paul speaks, of just as the Holy Spirit says, he's talking about through inspiration. Let's continue with the today thing. Because not the today show, sorry, but the today thing. Today, if you listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts as on the occasion of provoking bitter anger. Saying, don't be like the ones who caused them bitter anger. But today, if you listen to his voice, what's his voice? Well, the Bible is called the word of God. God's word. Interesting, ain't it? Listen to his voice. Not your opinion, not your interpretation, but his voice. Do not harden your hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, a hardened heart, nothing can get in. Solid as a rock, a heart of stone. Nothing can get in. Do not harden your hearts. As on the occasion of provoking bitter anger. Provoking? Ladies and gentlemen, somebody keeps provoking, picking, 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 hitting, hitting, just hitting that same spot over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You'll get irritated. They were provoking his anger intentionally. Who? Who was provoking God's anger intentionally? Well, as in the day of testing in the wilderness. What testing occurred in the wilderness? Let's, let's find out what testing occurred in the wilderness. So he named the place Mazras, uh, Massa, excuse me. Massa! Massa, I sorry. I just won't do it no more, Massa. And Meribah. Meribah and Massa. What's the name? What do they mean? Let's see if it's going to tell me what up. I'm supposed to be able to hover, but there is testing, trial. They put God to the test. Provoking his anger. And Meribah means quarreling. Oh, I could have just clicked on it there right next to each other. Lord have mercy. All right. Because of the quarreling of the Israelites, and because they put Jehovah to the test by saying, Jehovah is not in our midst. I mean, excuse me, is Jehovah in our midst or not? 
Let me ask you guys a question. Isn't this what people are doing today? Questioning whether or not Jehovah exists? Questioning whether or not he is there? And I promise you, Lord, have mercy, I promise you. Over in Turkey and Syria, people are questioning that. Over in Ukraine, people are questioning that. Here in America, people are questioning whether or not God exists. And they don't even realize they're testing him by doing such questioning. Hold on. Because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because they put Jehovah to the test by saying, is Jehovah in our midst or not? Imagine that. So let's find out again. Let's understand what's going on so that you guys will get it. <sighs> Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts as on occasion, on the occasion of provoking to bitter anger, as in the days of the testing in the wilderness, where your forefathers put me to the test and tried me despite seeing the my works for 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we all have heard the stories about the Israelites being set free from Egypt. We all hear of the 10 plagues on Egypt, but we don't focus on those 10 plagues. We don't focus on the significance of those 10 plagues. That was an entire nation. Pharaoh had at least a million men in his military, similar to the size of the military of America. He was the military power of that era. And they were wiped out as a military power. Now, those people, the Israelites, saw all of that. And then for 40 years, remember, he talks about, despite seeing my works for 40 years, for 40 years, 40, not five years, not 10 years, for 40 years, they experience time after time his coming to their aid. He provided food for them. He provided sustenance. He provided water. He provided for their safety. They did not freeze to death at night. We know how cold it gets out there in the desert, in the wilderness. They didn't freeze to death. They didn't have to worry about wearing jackets. Oh, it's cold this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I ran out of propane on purpose. No, I knew I had to clear the tank because I have to replace the valve. And so I have a new valve here, and I have two other valves because I went and got two more tanks, uh, seven, seven uh, gallon. And I have to place the, replace the valve. And so we'll be doing that today, and I'll be filling up my tanks on Sunday. Oh, Mama, he going to go fill up his tank. And he was, shut up. And so the whole point is, it's cold, Mama. The Israelites didn't experience that cold for 40 years. Every single winter, they didn't experience the scorching heat. You don't find a single scripture talking about them going through a scorching heat and how miserable it was in the wilderness. Go ahead. The people were complaining because they were in the wilderness and they didn't have a permanent home, but they were not complaining because it's too hot in the wilderness, around Sinai, around Horeb. They, they weren't complaining about that heat. But you go there now, man, it gets over 100 degrees during the summer in some of those places. The Israelites didn't experience that. He took care of them for 40 years. But yet, they provoked him to anger because they didn't appreciate what he had done. So let's do it again, ladies and gentlemen. Provoking to bitter anger as in the day of testing in the wilderness, where your forefathers put me to the test and tried me despite seeing my works for 40 years. This is why I became disgusted with this generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. 
and they have not come to know my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter into my rest. Uh-oh, there it is. That's the point of this video, ladies and gentlemen, so that you can understand where Jehovah has been. It has not been hidden. This has been known for greater than 6,000 years. Remember, a day to God is a 1,000 years. God's day of rest. It's going to be 7,000 years, people. I know. When the 7,000 year get here, because remember, it took him six days, not 7,000 years, six days, creative days. They were epochs. They weren't 6,000 years. They were thousands of years long. Each creative day was thousands of years. They were epochs. Because, remember, he created the 24-hour days, so they were not 24-hour days. That's where everybody goes way off the wagon when they think that they were 24-hour literal days. Or when they think they were 664 and one-fourth, or 65 and one-fourth annual days. He created days when he created the earth the sun, the moon, the stars, and the mountains. Okay? So, the days here were not the same days. So pay attention to what's being said. They will not enter into my rest. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. We're going to come back down to verse number 11, but I got to go up here and look for my word because it's a key word. It's in number three. Where are you at, number three? Nope, not there. I'm going to miss it. Where is it? I I don't know where my word is, y'all. I can't see it. I forgot where it was. I should have noted. <sighs> nope, it's down here. Oh, there it is right here. Today, if you will listen to his voice, it says today, ladies and gentlemen, present tense. And then it says, they will not enter into my rest. Ladies and gentlemen, this was said almost 2,000 years since Adam and Eve. Since he rested on the seventh day, and it said today. So it says they couldn't enter into his rest 2,000 years after he started resting. And then it says, they will not enter into my rest. Notice what Paul tries to get you all to understand. Beware, brothers, for fear you should ever develop it, or there should ever develop in any one of you a wicked heart, lacking faith. Ladies and gentlemen, a lack of faith and a wicked heart almost goes hand in hand. Not necessarily, but almost goes hand in hand. It goes hand in hand when there is a servant of God that want to put him to the test. Okay, but that lacking faith says, beware that there should ever develop in you a lack of faith by drawing away from the living God. Most people think God is dead because he hasn't been doing anything. The Bible refers to Jehovah as the living God. All the other gods out there are dead. They're wood, stone, and imagination. But go ahead. But keep on encouraging one another each day as long as, it's, as it is called today so that none of you should become hardened by the deceptive powers of sin. Ladies and gentlemen, he says that you should keep on encouraging one another. Why? He says each day, as long as it could be called today, present tense, as long as you're living in the present, he says you should be encouraging one another. No, he says keep on encouraging one another each day, as long as each day will be called today. Focus on today so that none of you should become hardened by the deceptive power of sin. For we actually became partakers of the Christ, or become partakers of the Christ, only if we hold firmly down to the end the confidence we had at the beginning. As it says, today, if you listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts as on the occasion of provoking him to bitter anger. For who heard and yet did not provoke him to bitter anger? All of the Israelites heard. All of the Israelites saw. And yet they provoked him to bitter anger because they lacked faith. 
Was it not, in fact, all of those who went out of Egypt under Moses? All of them. Even Moses at one point provoked Jehovah to bitter anger. Imagine that. But if Moses can do it, what, what is the hope for the rest of us? <sighs> Pay attention. Moreover, with whom did God become disgusted for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? and whose dead bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter into his rest? Because he's still resting, everyone. Was it not to those who acted disobediently? The ones who don't obey. We're going to talk about that in a minute. That's where this is leading to. So we see that they could not enter into his rest because of a lack of faith in him and who he is as a person. Therefore, since a promise of entering into his rest remains, that's right, he says today, do not harden your hearts as on a, the occasion of those in the wilderness. So that meant that his rest was continuing because when he said today, do not harden your hearts, pay attention, that was several millennia after. <sighs> for us to be on guard. For fear, someone among you seems to fall short of it. So, ladies and gentlemen, since the promise of entering into God's rest remains, be on your guard and be in fear of falling short by lacking faith that he is not dead, that he has not forgotten that something else is going on for which you are not yet knowledgeable of, but the scriptures does tell us what's going on in the background. You just haven't come to that information yet. For we have also had the good news declared to us just as they had, but the word that they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. Ladies and gentlemen, the people who have faith are those who listen. The people who don't have faith are those who don't listen. That's why they lack faith, because they fail to heed his voice. Did he not say listen? That they didn't listen? Let's go. For we who have exercised faith do enter into the rest just as he said, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter into my rest, although his works were finished from the founding of the world. That's what Paul is saying. He rested on the seventh day, and yet here it was so much time later that he was still resting. Ladies and gentlemen, his rest period is just about over. But people on this planet... <sighs> don't understand this because there's no one out there to teach them this because they can't find it on their own because it's absent from them when they read it they're seeing something completely different than to know exactly what paul was saying to begin with that he is still resting pay attention for in one place he has said on the seventh day as follows and god rested on the seventh day from all his works and here again it says that they will not enter into his rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter into it, and those to whom the good news was first declared did not enter in because of disobedience, he again marks off a certain day by saying long afterwards in David's Psalms, today, just as it, it has been said above, today, if you listen to his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had led them to a place of rest, remember Joshua conquered the promised land? So if Joshua had led them to a place of rest, God would not afterwards have spoken of another day, today. So there remains a Sabbath rest. That's right. He rested on the Sabbath day, so it's called a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the man who has entered into God's rest has also rested from his own works, just as God did from his own works. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, 
Let us therefore do our utmost to enter into that rest, God's Sabbath rest, so that no one may fall into the same pattern of disobedience or the same pattern of sin, of a lack of faith. For the word of God is alive and exerts power and is sharper than any two-edged sword and pierces even the divining of soul, spirit, and of joints and uh, from the marrow and is able to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is not a creation that is hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and openly exposed to the eyes of the one to whom we must give an account. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to give an accounting to Jehovah. So those of you who think that all of these events that are happening on this earth, all of the things that are happening to you, that he is not mindful of, that he is just not going to do anything, that he's going to let you suffer. Let's take two points. We're going to, we have to clear out of this. So let's clear this. And we're going to go to Corinthians. And we are going to go to First Corinthians, and we can go to number 10. Now, before, I didn't understand how this works. See, I click on all of those. That's not what I want. I want to click on this one right here. Now I knows, and then I'm going to go to 10 right here. And then we add 10, and then we can go to number, well, technically 11, 12, and 13 is what I would normally read. But we're just going to go through number 13. He says, no temptation has come upon you except what is common to man. But see, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But along with the temptation, he will make a way out so that you will be able to endure it. For some people, like those who are in Turkey, who are under those buildings, and there is no help coming, the way out for them is probably going to be a temporary death because he promises a resurrection for those who have died. However, for the other people you see being rescued, he promises a way out. Now, some people say, oh, that's clever. That, 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 that could be applied to every situation. You've got to believe it. And here's the problem. Those people who are saying things like that, saying that's clever, they don't seem to get it and understand. That's by design. It's just our minds want to trick us into believing that there's something nefarious, that there's just, oh, that's just common. And that's, people say things like that all the time. And, and, and those people, again, those are the people that he's not talking to. Those are the cynical ones. The cynical people he doesn't, he doesn't care for. Look, he said, this is for his people. Jesus said, this was for his people. Now, God's people and Jesus' people are the same people. It's just they are not the cynical people. So, finally, ladies and gentlemen, we have one book, two chapters, and that's the book of Revelation. For a long time, I said Revelations as in an S, as saying that there were a lot of Revelations, but it's only one, Revelation, without the S. Pay attention. We're going to the 20th chapter, and we're going to go to 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. That section right here, this is the best section in the world for explaining this. And I saw a great white throne. The same white throne is seen in the book of Daniel, the 7th chapter. And the one seated on it, from before him, the earth, that, that sinful earth, the earth that's doing everything wrong. See, God is now coming out of his rest, people. And the heavens, the one where Satan was misleading, even the angels, fled away. And no place was found for them. They're gone. At this time, when this happens, they're gone. And I saw the dead. Now, when he says, I saw the dead, now you see all of these <sighs> intelligent people making it look like the dead are standing before God, literally. Ladies and gentlemen, they're not standing. The dead cannot stand. The dead fall asleep in death. They don't stand. So this is symbolic. I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne and scrolls were open, but another scroll was open, 
and it was the scroll of life. And the dead were judged out of the things written in the scroll according to their deeds. Wait a minute. If the dead don't stand, then who are these dead? Oh, you didn't understand that mankind is in a death-like state since Adam and Eve? Remember, did we not discuss how Satan's intention was with death in mind? So mankind has been dead to God. That's why it says that we should become alive. Those of us, it says that in John, the fifth chapter, roughly verse 25 through 28, that God had life in himself and he's given to the son to have life in himself that he might give life to mankind. And it speaks about those who are alive in Christ. Pay attention. The fact is, at this point, we are all dead, symbolically, and uh, what do you say? Um, there's another word I'm trying to think of, and it's not coming to me. But it's um, where something is likened to something. So we are likened to being dead. Hold on, we'll talk about it in a second. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the scrolls were open, but another scroll was open, and it was called the scroll of life. And the dead were judged during a thousand years. There's going to be a thousand year period of time where individuals will have the opportunity to prove that they will serve Jehovah his way, that they will listen to his voice. Remember, the whole problem with the Israelites, they couldn't enter into his rest because they had hardened their hearts. We're told not to harden our hearts. So even for those who have died, he's going to give them an opportunity to not have hardened hearts. Okay? And the dead were judged out of the things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those scrolls haven't been opened yet, so they cannot be judged. So during the thousand years is when those scrolls are opened, and thus they are judged. Pay attention. Right here, I saw a great angel coming down out of heaven. The key of the abyss was given to him and a great chain. Well, I, I added the given to him, but hold on. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven with the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he sees the dragon, the original serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him with that chain for a thousand years. That's why it's called Judgment Day, because the scriptures mention that a day to God is as a thousand years. So this is the judgment period. Why? How do we know this is the judgment period? Well, let's find out right here. And as soon as the thousand years had ended, Satan will be let out, let loose out of his prison, and he will go out to mislead the nations of the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog stands for that disobedient group of mankind as a whole. It's not a land, even though it's called the land of Gog and Magog, it's the land in which these persons inhabited at the time to which they are associated, to gather them together for the war, the number of those being as the sands of the sea. Okay, this is Judgment Day, ladies and gentlemen. This is where those individuals are going to be judged. That's why it's spoken of right after that period. And it says, And the sea gave up those dead in them, and death in Hades, or the grave, you're going to see it's going to say Hades. Hades, Hades, Hades. The common grave of mankind. It's just the place where people are buried. The grave. And death and the grave gave up those, or gave up the dead in them. And they were judged individually according to their deeds. The reason why you're hearing me misapply words is because I read from several different versions, and several different versions have that so that is because i'm accustomed to reading the other version as opposed to this version and there you go and death and the grave were hurled into the lake of fire this means the second death the lake of fire everybody thinks that hades or where is that thing the grave is a fiery place where people go and they burn for eternal damnation that's not what the scriptures say it says, death and Hades, the grave, were hurled into the lake of fire. So the lake of fire is not Hades. Dante's Inferno? No, the lake of fire is not Dante's Inferno. The lake of fire simply means the second death. Pay attention. Death and Hades were hurled into the lake of fire. This means the second death. The lake of fire. 
Furthermore, whoever was not found written in the book of life were held into the lake of fire, the second death. How do we know this? We go to verse number eight of the 21st chapter. It says, and the cowards and those who are without faith and those who are discussing in their filth and the murderers and the sexually immoral and those partaking of uh, practicing spiritism and the idolaters and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur or in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. This means the second death. It means the second death. It tells you what it means. But it's a symbol. It's symbolic. That's right. But it means just simply the second death. But what's the second death? It means that there's no resurrection. It means that there is no resurrection from the second death. That means it's permanent. So they'll never, ever, 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 ever exist again. Not a molecule or particle. They're completely gone forever. That's what the second death is. Ladies and gentlemen, Jehovah's Witnesses offer Bible studies to people, and they pretty much go over the details of something similar to what I just showed you, but it's more organized. And we're living in a time period, like I said, where everybody's wondering. Everybody's trying to figure this out. They're wondering, where is God in all of this? Remember, the one who causes death is not God. That is Satan. But he says he's a vengeful God. Yes, he is. But since Christ, remember, since Christ, he's put everything into Christ's hands. And Christ has made sure we understood that he, his father, is a God of love. And that he came to carry out the will of his father. And how we must love our neighbor just as ourselves. And we must love our God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. So during the period since Christ has been here, there has been no God going and using his people to clear out the land of wicked people, because that's what he originally did with the promised land. That's why Joshua went through those lands and conquered them. That's why the scriptures we read earlier spoke of Joshua not leading them into uh, the peace that equated to God's rest the God of peace and the Lord of peace and the King of peace. Well, Jesus is the Lord and King of peace. Jehovah is the God of peace. They're ushering in that period. Now, they're preparing people now, but the time period which we now live is for entering into his rest. for entering into his rest. If you are interested in entering into his rest, go back over the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, or excuse me, the second chapter, the fourth chapter, and the third chapter. You mean the second chapter through the fourth chapter? Well, yeah, that's what I just said. No, you didn't. You said the second chapter, the fourth chapter, and the third chapter. Yeah, but you said it out of order. Well, sometimes you gotta be out of order. Okay, well, you just you, you can stop now because you're, you're confusing people. So, ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of this was <sighs> I've been very disturbed. I haven't done videos in a couple of days because I really have been disturbed when I found out that they were putting arsenic and lead and other carcinogens in baby formula. And then I found out that the FDA supposedly did not regulate baby food of all things they regulate a food the food that the adults take in but they don't regulate the food babies take in well apparently that's changing now hold on and then they said that lead didn't lead to autism arsenic didn't lead to autism can you imagine this stupidity and we have all of these people growing up now suffering because they are, they have no clue. Scientists and psychologists are saying it's because of this or that, and it's not. It's because they've been poisoned since infancy, people. They've been poisoned deliberately by this country and other nations allowing lead and arsenic to be put in their baby food. Do yourselves a favor. Stay away from Procter & Gamble and all these other companies that practice this. Look, we're segueing from um, this part right here. We've already covered this. 
those of you who stayed around until this point, when they held me in North Carolina, literally for three weeks, 45 days, 45 days, exactly. 45 days was that stint for nothing. Just <laughs> held me. And I finally had to tell the judge because he said, oh, we're going to appoint an attorney. You will not appoint no stupid attorney to represent my person. Not any time. Well, no, we're going to. What did I say? You know, we had an argument and <laughs> they didn't appoint an attorney. I didn't put any motions in or nothing because the God that I served told me that I would meet 45 people who didn't know who he was. And I promise you, uh, Rashad and John and there was a young man, his name was Corey. Uh, all of these people I met, including Mr. Lucius Lucky. I'll probably get in touch with Lucius Lucky. Uh, but met all of these gentlemen, 45 men who had not heard of Jehovah, didn't know who he was, didn't know what his promises were. 45 people in that 45-day period, not a person a day. Sometimes it was 10, sometimes it was three, sometimes it was four, but it was 45 people because I was counting because I didn't want to be in there any longer. And literally on the 45th day after meeting that 45th person, which I was told I would meet 45 people when I traveled east who did not know who Jehovah was. And I was released on the day right after I spoke to that 45th person. And it happened to actually be the 45th day of that experience. That was my experience. But one of the gentlemen that I met during that vacation. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I digress. It wasn't that vacation. It was the one in Puerto Rico when they were sending me for a so-called psych evaluation. One of the gentlemen who happened to be my celly in North Carolina. When. No, that was Georgia. Georgia! He was from North Carolina, but he was my celly temporarily. And we were talking, and he told me about how he worked for Procter & Gamble and how they had a non-disclosure that they signed. That's why I won't tell you his name. <laughs> and I purposely won't tell you his name because I made sure I forgot it so that if I repeated this story, I would not cause him any problems because I am aware that they make people sign non-disclosure agreements in situations like that. And no, there was no cause for me not to believe him because he was bringing up the conversation in a regular conversation, showing that he had what places he had worked at. And he talked about that because we were talking about food, because I was keen on what I was eating at that time, because muscular dystrophy. Ladies and gentlemen, the muscular dystrophy is not your business. I only tell people about it because I have people who are my people who have been concerned about my health and so i let them know in my videos i'm not asking for your medical advice you send me anything on medical advice what i should take and what i shouldn't take and guess what i will do i will block you because you are letting me know that you're definitely not my people wait hold on hold on just so that you understand the same way jehovah lets people know that they're not his people when they disobey him now i'm not saying you have to obey me i'm saying it's the same way the same way that he can take a person's name out of the book of life and add their name to the book of life and remove their name from the book of life, I can remove you from my email list. So that's what I'm saying. So if you want to ignore me, then that lets me know that you don't appreciate me as a person. And since you don't appreciate me, even though you want to make it appear that you appreciate me, I will remove you from the book of email. <laughs> okay, back to the conversation. This young man talked about how he worked at Procter & Gamble and how they had these tractor trailer trailers that were overly long, like the over wide load. But this was at their facility, not being on the highway because they would be too big for the highway. But these things would travel in the facility. And he said they would have cucumbers and squash and carrots. And these things would be huge. As tall as a four-story building in some cases. I didn't believe that. But then I did believe it because I know that they have been working on technology to grow food and to make them bigger. I mean, we see all the pumpkin patches where they got these big, huge pumpkins and they, they do it every year. I told you I was in New Mexico. And my house was along a, a cow path, 
where cows walked through my property. And when I first got there, the cows would look so scrawny and bony and like it was a Joseph telling Pharaoh of, uh, you know, the dream that Pharaoh had, and he was interpreting through God the dream that Pharaoh had about the cows that were lightly fleshed and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's what these cows would look like. And then two weeks later, those very same cows that were walking along that very same trail were four and 500 pounds. In two weeks, how do they gain four and 500 pounds in two weeks? I automatically knew that it was the steroids that they feed them. The growth hormones and then i reason that's why i stopped eating meat at that point because i reason wait a minute if they put that stuff in the animals and we're eating that then that means that's happening to us lord have mercy isn't it a shame that this is our life well it's not a shame because the true god says that he's about to correct all of this Now, I have faith towards God that he's going to do this. And the reason why I have that faith is because he says that he's still resting. Ladies and gentlemen, he's the God of his word. He keeps his word. That's what the name Jehovah means. He keeps his promises. So if he's still resting and if he said that he was going to rest, then we have to understand that Satan is taking advantage of that rest. And he's doing it on purpose. But what does the scripture say when God comes out of his rest? What's the first thing that's going to happen? Satan's getting put in jail. Seriously, he's going to be locked up. Why? Because he decided to, you know, when your mama, your mama's gone, and you know, they say, we're going to be back, but we're going to leave you in charge of the house because my mama did that from time to time. We were 15, 16 years old. And my mama came back and anything was messed up or wrong or out of place. Woo-wee! Because I remember one time my mama left. My brother caused me some problems. And, well, basically I manhandled him. I, I, I don't appreciate what I did. That was wrong for me. But he didn't understand that I was so fed up with everything. And we were all going through something at the time. My father had died previously. Not during that period, but previously. And there were a lot of things that just wasn't right in our household. Not things that were wrong, but just wasn't right because nobody talked about it. My father's death, none of us talked about it. We never worked through his death as a family. Because who could prepare us for something like that? I mean, my mother's mother died and nobody worked through that with her. Her family members didn't work through that with her somebody dies that's a lot of trauma well anyway ladies and gentlemen with all this is being said i know that there are so many people out there trying to figure things out i just can tell you that the pandemic thing isn't over you notice how we're not hearing it in the news we're not hearing about any new variants or anything the united states closed off its borders with china we're not hearing anything from china you guys have no idea what's coming but you can imagine what's coming. I talked to you about the baby food and all that stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, they are purposely trying to poison us. Now, why is that? Why is that? Arsenic and lead. Remember, they put lead into the environment in the 1930s and 40s with leaded gasoline. It was purposely said that it was lead gasoline. They gave us an excuse as to why they put lead gasoline. And then they're saying the guy who did it, he's sitting up here feeling sorry for himself because he didn't understand the effects of lead on people. Please, they understood the effect of lead on people and taking it into our systems and breathing it in. They understood that because they understood during the stupid plague. They understood the fact that people who were sitting up there drinking alcoholic beverages through lead that chemical composition was literally making them pass out as if they were dead it was acting as an anesthetic they knew this they were burying people alive because they thought they were dead because of lead so they knew the effect that lead has on people's health and they still put it in the environment and they did it for almost 70 years people 70 years putting lead in gasoline and letting it be pumped in the air throughout the entire world. Pay attention. For what reason? Well, it was to help with this blah, 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 whatever. 
They knew the effects of lead. They've known it for decades. They've seen how many people have died as a result of lead poisoning. They knew this, and they still put it in gasoline, knowing that people would breathe in that exhaust. And it wasn't until there was so much outcry. And then they talked about the children having autism. There was a young man. His name was, I think it was Bryce. I'm not sure. It's been a while. And his family was trying to take care of this young man, and he had autism. But his personality, perfect young man, but he had autism. Jehovah has promised that he's going to correct that, and I trust him. Do you understand? I trust Jehovah to correct that. Why do I trust Jehovah to correct that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why I trust Jehovah to correct it is because he says he will correct it. I mean, there, there's that's the only reason. See, Jehovah gives his word. He keeps his word. That's the only reason. Okay, I spent an hour and 10 minutes talking to you guys about this only because somebody brought up the conversation this morning. And I said, hey, I'm going to tell people about that because I know people are concerned as to, is God, is he there? Or are we just out here to fit on our own? Can you imagine if what this world would be like if everybody thought there was no God? Look, no, no, literally, just think about it this way. If everybody throughout the world thought there was no God, can you imagine where we would be right now? No, you can't imagine that. Because that wouldn't be a world. We would have been destroyed some time ago. It is the belief in a God. I remember he started it. Oh, no, you started it. No, you started it. No, you started it. No, he started it. He started the belief in God. It was Satan who started the belief in other gods. Especially when he and the demons decided to come down here and mince among men. And now we have the demigods and the so-called Nephilim. But if not for all of that stupidity, ladies and gentlemen, if not for all of that stupidity. Okay, let's let you guys go. That's an hour and 12 minutes and y'all don't need to do that. Okay, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk to you all about this. And then we'll start talking about the money and things in a couple of days. I'm working on documents for people because I got people who are going through some dire things and I have to get this stuff out, but I have to do it uniformly and it is a lot of work. Gotta go. Take care.